Yeah, okay. Hi, guys. Uh, Alex here. Uh, so my name is Alexei, uh, Alex uh, Matveev. I'm working here at DevExperts as well with uh, Georgi. Uh, thanks for his presentation. So we work in the same team, actually, that is called DxCharts. And uh, here are a lot of interesting developer um, problems here. So I'm very happy to present and share with you uh, mine today. And uh, it is called uh, data migration problems. And a very specific case called uh, data migration and some easy peasy solution that you can uh, apply here. So first of all, why, uh, why me? Why I'm telling you about this? Uh, I have actually a lot of years of an experience uh, software development, and I worked in both uh, back-end and front-end, like split it in a half, six years and five years maybe. Uh, what is also important that I worked with some production system with uh, a lot of production servers. And uh, this huge topic uh, called data migrator, the data migration thing, it is uh, a bit of a pickle uh, in these production systems. So th there, are, there are a lot of people involved and it's a pretty hard topic. Um, and during my um, career, I stumbled, uh, I came across these four different data migrator solutions. So uh, I'm going to share with you today the one I implemented, the um, last one. Okay, so here we go. Uh, data migration, right? So let's first think about what data is in these terms. And uh, data can be some, you know, abstract information from the world that we somehow obtain and process and we just um, uh, transform it into our lifetime experience, right? Some abstract information from everywhere. Uh, that's not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about physical files, something more uh, to, the, to the engineer's level. Uh, so when I say data today, think physical files and bytes stored on your computer. That's pretty easy. Uh, and even though, speaking about files, there can be multiple of those, right? Some binary files, uh, textual files, um, there is this cluster we call system files that we usually don't care about. They just exist and nobody reads them. So we won't talk about these. Uh, there can be, there is a cluster called big data, right? That uh, we're having troubles uh, to process and we need to use some specific algorithms to work with them. Um, so that's also not the topic of our discussion. Um, the category I call recoverable files. That's, that's something you can uh, download again from the from the internet and if for some reason you lose it then you can just uh, take it again and you know download it no problem uh, and there is one last category that we are going to focus today called user data so user data is something that is very important for you as a user your list of birthdays of your friends uh, some to-do lists uh, your favorite music and films um, I play piano, for example, and uh, I uh, usually write on a piece of paper some compositions that I learn, so I don't forget about them and I can return back to them in two years and then remember my repertoire. Uh, maybe some sport activity, the bookmarks, so anything that is uh, valuable only for you and not for other people, that's what we call user data. Uh, and back in the days, we were writing these on some piece of paper, uh, on, on notebooks, right? Uh, and it, it, is, it is okay, but uh, we have some troubles to storing this data and organizing it. So we're really not very good at uh, storing something that is very valuable for us. So instead, today we have these different services which help us to organize and uh, store our data. Right, so all these Google Cloud, Evernote, uh, even Netflix, I'm talking about some favorites, for example, uh, Spotify with, uh, with its playlists. So all these things is something that is valuable for us. Um, and sometimes uh, the software is not doing great with saving our data. So as, as engineers, we're always, we should uh, think about saving this user data and uh, transforming it, uh, preserving it for the user. So maybe some of you uh, will, uh, we're reinstalling Windows 7 <laughs> in your life and uh, uh, there was a problem, maybe there is, uh, uh, there is still actually a problem when you have your operating system and when you transition to the new one, when you reinstall it, all your favorite applications got lost. Um, 
so you need to reinstall this again. It's, it's not very great. You, know, you, you don't like this as a user. You want to, to have them back. Uh, another example is uh, I was uh, recently uh, organizing my bookmarks in Google Chrome. And uh, these bookmarks, uh, I spent like two hours maybe to uh, organize them. Uh, and then uh, I launched uh, Chrome on my laptop on my other device. Uh, and uh, the problem was the synchronization was not turned on. So when I turned it on, it uh, actually erased all my two hours work. So uh, yeah, it, it has no version control or stuff like this. So I was um, forced to do the same job again. I was pretty frustrated. So users are very frustrated when losing uh, their data. And if you don't carry it uh, gently, uh, they will turn their back on you. So let's remember that. But of course, uh, the software that we develop is constantly changing. Without changes, the software is dying. We need to, to improve new features. We need to um, bring some new relations to the database. Maybe tomorrow your company would uh, create some new business models and you need to uh, bring them to your software. So all these things, they may bring um, changes to your software. Um, so what I mean here, that your data uh, here, uh, let's take the small example, is also changing. Um, let's say you're a startup and uh, you can, you're creating this small um, contact list application. Uh, so for the first iteration, you have something small like this. Um, in the next iteration, version two, let's say, you have this uh, green triangle over here and your address list <clears throat> can become um, this destructured uh, properties like CT line one and line two. So become a bit complex. Then you may have something like this uh, and include even your home and work address uh, to this uh, small object and maybe your phone as well. So you see, even with this small example, the data is always transforming. Um, so why, why, it, uh, why it is a problem for us? So the problem is that the, the, the shape of data uh, should match the version of your application. Like on this uh, kid's toy example, you, you cannot, uh, no matter how hard you push, you cannot uh, put this shape into the wrong hole. Um, well, in, in this example, maybe you can <laughs> and break uh, the law of physics, but in software, it's not like that. And your application would rather crash. So let's uh, see an example here. Uh, you have this application version, and uh, here um, up, you have this data version. And each application version should consume only corresponding data version here. Um, so you can tell me everything is great, right? So what's the problem? Just use the correct data version for your application. Well, the problem is that uh, if you already have version 3, but your users are using the old data version, let's say you launch that version 2 to production, then you may already have those um, yellow rectangles and uh, green triangles, <laughs> a lot of geometrical shapes today, in production. So you, you the, and these uh, shapes, they won't fit your version 3 that is currently at production. And your application, of course, would crash. Uh, so you're in trouble. Uh, what you can do about it? You can, for example, say to the user, hey, uh, we have a problem. Your data is not matching our app version. So you know what? We will just completely drop it. We will skip it, we will reset to default, and uh, then it will work correctly. But uh, in this case, you will break the original law and you will, uh, you will forget about this user data, which as I said before, is pretty important. So it's always like a balance here between saving the user data and uh, ensuring that your application would not crash. Um, so the, there is actually a software, instead of, uh, sorry, instead of, um, dropping the data and resetting to default, what you need to do is to transform those data into different shapes. And you need software which is doing this for you. There is actually a family of this software called data migrators, and there are quite plenty of them. Um, originally, this is a server story. So maybe uh, here today we have this front end days. Um, maybe uh, not many of you worked with the data migrators before because it's the server guy's responsibility. Um, so all uh, modern databases like Postgres and MongoDB, they're using this 
um, migrate, migrator component, there are, there are always also this uh, liquid base and FlyDB solutions that are doing the same thing. So what data migrator does? Uh, it should update the data that is already persistent. So it, it works uh, on something that uh, you already have in production or database. Uh, it has some sort of migration scripts, which is like a state machine. That they are transforming versions uh, between different uh, data. Uh, and of course, it should know the target and the source version. So he understands how to, it understands how to transform. And it should work very stable. Uh, if not, then the data would be lost, and that's like critical no-no for the user here. So this is, in a nutshell, how the data migrator works. It is like a black box, well, black circle in this case, and you have all those migration scripts. Um, the input is any shape of data, so we're going here. Uh, and then, let's say our input is this yellow rectangle, right? Uh, then we're going here we have this migration script from version one to version two. So the output would be the green triangle. We successfully migrated our data to the, another shape. Then we can take this triangle, put it into a uh, next migration scripts chain and uh, get this blue circle as the output. Voila, pretty simple, it works pretty simple. Um, so the classical, uh, let's, how it, let's take a look how it works in real life. Uh, the classical situation is the offline da database migration. So imagine having the production, and uh, you're, uh, you're right here, uh, right now. You have this version one, classic three-level architecture. You have your front-end app, you have some server, and you have your database. So everything is synchronized, it works nice. But then you have new features, and uh, you release version two with uh, another shape of your data. So somehow you need to transform it. And uh, on this scheme, you see that uh, the data migrator is, uh, is, it is located between these databases. So there is some, uh, some kind of offline process. There are special people that are, that are uh, transforming the data right in the database uh, at some specific time. Uh, and when, then when you have version 3, of course, this triangle is again transformed to the blue circle. And uh, these are different migration scripts. So the benefits of this solution is that everything can be planned and tested. Everything is pretty safe. Uh, you always have a chance to roll back. That's, that's pretty cool. So uh, especially for some huge businesses, it's a way to go because they want to ensure that everything works smoothly and correctly in production and they don't lose their users. So what are the downsides? Uh, usually in this solution, you require downtime because you need to ensure that no new data would come uh, when you're doing this uh, transition from old schema version to new schema version. So you need some downtime, you need to plan it maybe for the weekends. Um, and the other downside I see is that migrating databases is not very easy. You need special people, you need to know uh, SQL, uh, maybe some other techniques. So it, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, now, the uh, the situation is that uh, this uh, classic migration also had another flaw, and that's because of mobile applications. So when we're talking about mobile applications, we actually have different versions of the same app uh, in different users. So multiple users have different app versions, and um, nobody likes updates. So how many of you are, are going to this App Store and Google Play regularly and updating, putting this Update All button uh, but not, the, not more than a few. Um, so users may have different application versions and this um, version of organization is not working with multiple versions, only with one. Uh, and to overcome uh, these uh, difficulties, you may use another solution that I call on-the-fly migrator. So what we have here is a server uh, and this data migrator is not uh, in a form of some offline migration scripts, but rather uh, some library, some transformer maybe, not the migrator. Uh, and you have different clients. For example, this client with version one, it is sending his shape, his rectangle to your server, and it is transforming it to some other shape, which then can be stored to the uh, database. Um, and then maybe you need to send this data to client two, which has version two. So 
I, I think you, you got the idea. You have this um, unique transformer which can do all the stuff. Um, sometimes this is also organized uh, in this way. So you have different API versions and each client goes to his own API version. So in this case, this um, data migrator component is just uh, destructured, so to say, uh, in the code, in this different API. So the benefits of this approach would be uh, no downtime. You actually don't need any downtime. Uh, just uh, reinstall your servers uh, very fast. Uh, and uh, yeah, you already, you're ready to go with the existing data on the fly. Of course, you can support multiple versions. Um, and because this migrator thing is written in, on your server, it, uh, it may support uh, you know, more powerful configuration than SQL scripts. You can write it in Java, in C Sharp, in Kotlin, on any other language and use its power. So the, the cons are um, this solution is not safe because you can make a mistake in production and that's, uh, that's not an easy thing to do. You always uh, need to think about that you're at the high, high risk zone here. You need to uh, set up some reporting tools and have your support guys uh, nearby so they can um, give you a hint what is going wrong in production. Okay, so these were the two solutions. And uh, now to the very specific one that we used in our charting application. Uh, so what happens here if I take this uh, data transformer component and put it on the front end? Let's put it on the front end, why not? Then we have something I call front end on the fly migration or just front end data migration. So let's th read this diagram with me. You have your application here, you have the server, uh, and it stores uh, this data in some database. Everything is great. Then you have the next version, the version two. So what happens here is that in your database, you have the data in the form of yellow rectangle. So the server is sending you, if you follow my cursor here, is sending you this yellow rectangle. So what you do, you're using your migrator right in the front end, right in your JavaScript, to transform it to uh, this uh, green triangle. So it fits your application version. And when you need to persist it, then you're sending the, the triangle and the server uh, is saving it as plain data. This plain data is pretty important here. And of course, next time when you have version three, uh, you receive this uh, triangle and transform it to the circles and, and save the circle. So why would, why would uh, we need uh, such a solution? It has uh, pretty much the same advantages and disadvantages as for uh, server on the fly migration for mobile devices. But there are two specific things here that I find useful. Uh, one of them is that uh, we actually don't need any backend competencies here. Uh, as I said before, migration is, is not an easy thing to do. And uh, sometimes you need some specific guys to do it. Uh, I used in companies which are, had this DBAs, database administrators, which were doing this thing for us. Um, it, it was like a team doing this thing. And now you don't need these guys. You can just uh, uh, make it on the front end with your, uh, with your colleagues. That's one benefit. And the other huge benefit uh, is that the data, the knowledge about the data transformation is concentrated on this front end team. So uh, this is pretty important here. Uh, this is our charting application, as George already showed you before. So this library is uh, used by uh, traders. Uh, what they do here, they actually uh, are performing uh, so-called technical analysis. Um, so they're trying to predict uh, where the price would go and get some benefit out of it. Uh, and this technical analysis is uh, something which may uh, transform uh, the uh, this default state of chart into something like this after spending here uh, some time. So you're making some drawings, putting some textual notes, uh, some icons, and adding some derivative technical indicators. Uh, you also have different uh, type of uh, financial securities like stocks, you have options and futures, uh, you have um, cryptocurrencies, right? You have forex pairs, and for all of these, you need different types of layout. So you're, you're configuring different types of layouts and uh, you need all of them. You're configuring them uh, 
uh, very, uh, uh, yeah, you're spending a lot of time here to configure this layout. So you can spend like eight hours doing this, like uh, me with the bookmarks in Chrome. Uh, so this thing is 147% user data, right? Um, and more important is that this data is not used anywhere but chart. So when uh, we, um, this chart in the library is actually integrated into other products. It is, uh, it is like a library, it is integrated. So it's not used as the standalone thing, but uh, rather as part of something. And other products, they're not interested in this data anyhow. They're not doing with it anything. And of course, they do not care about how we transform this data and what we do with it. Uh, so that's why, uh, as a chart team, uh, as uh, a team which are producing product or any library, we should deliver this data migration as part of our product or deliver it as a service. So imagine this situation. This, um, Team one is our DX chart team. Uh, and this, uh, this cool uh, geometrical shapes here are our different uh, versions, different data that we have. So team two is not interested in this data. Uh, we only ask team two to persist it in a database. So that's why we put this data migrator tool right in the front end in our product and when team two send us the old data version, as you see here, this yellow rectangle, we just do all the magic for them. So we're acting as a service. And that's very cool because team two has to do nothing. And that's like the, the most important point of my presentation for today. If you want to act as a service for other team, then you should provide uh, this data migration as well. So they, they, they don't need to do it themselves. Okay, so we talked about different data migrations today, a lot of uh, migration words. Uh, so let me actually give you some tips and tricks how you can write a data migrator for your own. Um, well, first of all, you should version your data, put some versions inside. You can use uh, plain versioning, like uh, ascending integers from one to infinity, or you can use semantic versioning, like one to three, if you care about majors and minors. Um, but the most important thing, you should always sync your data version with your application version because they should match. Um, here's just an example how you should, let's read this together. So a bunch of versions on the screen, uh, ascending order. And let's say your application is currently at this version uh, 4.1.0. Uh, and let's say you have a client which are using some old data version 3.9.26. So what you should you do here, you should take uh, the delta, delta between these, uh, these versions, this green zone, this curly brace, uh, and try to find out if there are any migrations that should run in between of these versions. And if there are any, of course, you should run them, and then your data is transformed to the correct shape and your application runs and it does not crash. Uh, tip number two, always test your migration scripts. So uh, maybe it's the ugliest thing that can happen with you in production that your migration script failed and uh, you have to deal with this somehow. So um, maybe a good idea is to act uh, preemptively uh, and fix uh, all the errors before you have the production. So test a lot. Uh, here are a bunch of tools for you on the screen uh, that are very good at end-to-end -end testing. Um, always keep some old data versions uh, that uh, you can test on new applications. Uh, and maybe a good idea is also to take production data and run it on your application from time to time. Um, one extra hint here about auto tests. Um, I don't like writing complex auto tests because I think it consumes a lot of developers' time. So what I suggest to you is uh, something I call a click everywhere approach. So what you do, you take a replication and you click uh, every parts of it, just to make some script which clicks it. Uh, and a very easy check is to uh, take your console and check if it's read, if there are some errors. If there are no errors, then you're great, you're good. Uh, if there are some errors, maybe it's good to fix them. Very easy auto testing. Uh, soft launch. So even though you make all the things uh, and you prepare and you test it, everything can go, anything can go wrong in production. So uh, always wrap your code inside the try-catch. 
uh, and be ready for this. Be ready that some unexpected uh, cannot find uh, something of undefined happens. Uh, and if this happens, you may reset to default, but uh, of course do not overwrite the incoming data so you do not lose it. Maybe send your users some uh, information that, hey, something went wrong, but uh, we are working on this, our best engineers are working on this, but at any cost, do not reset uh, to default like 100%, just uh, make sure that application starts. Um, and of course, good idea is to make production locks. Locks are your eyes, without it, you are blind. Um, so here is an example of uh, logs that we do have in uh, DX chart. Let's take a look. So you see that the layout version does not match the current one. Very clearly, uh, you can see that the versions do not match. It tries to migrate. Um, then uh, it uh, found some migration scripts, as you can see here, and successfully migrated uh, this version to the latest. So that's something that you want to see in your logs as well. Um, of course, uh, on front end, we're using TypeScript. Uh, it would be stupid to not make use of this. Uh, if you're making these different data versions, then of course you would need different type versions. Um, for some small cases, it can be easy. So you don't need to copy your whole types uh, to the new uh, uh, to the new folder and have uh, you know multiple copies of these. Sometimes it can be very uh, not very easy. So one little trick here is to use the type of operator of TypeScript. Um, and um, yeah, so let's read the code here. You have some example of the data, it's just a JSON. Uh, and what you can do with TypeScript is uh, make type of this JSON. And it will try to naively build you the type for this object. Um, of course, that would not be the like 100% type of that object because when it uh, comes across some array or some complex object, it may not find the correct typing for it. But at least uh, you may have some typing and you don't need to copy all these types. This is, by the way, the example of a migration script, uh, some way of how you can implement it. You should give it some name, this migration function, which accepts uh, one shape of data, and then it returns the result, which is another shape, the transformed one. Yeah, and here you're typing, you're casting uh, the data to this type, uh, which is a result of type of. So now with this data v1 typed variable, you can just uh, have a nice autocomplete in your ID. That's pretty great. Um, if that's enough, not enough for you, then tip uh, 4.1, use some runtime validations. Uh, so here at DevExperts, we're using these two tools. One is called IOTS. Uh, the second one is called JSON schema. Um, they're doing pretty much the same thing. So uh, if you have some input from the server, let's say, uh, and you want to understand where exactly something went wrong or if this, uh, this object is correct, then you can define uh, the type for this object. As you can see, uh, this is example from um, official site of IOTS. Uh, so you have this user with user ID and name. Um, we're defining the type here. And then it um, returns an object with the decode method. And inside you can pass in an object. Uh, and here you can see that it gives me an error. Why error? Because uh, I don't have user ID in this object. So it will uh, give me exact um, reporting of where my huge object is incorrect. So I have a chance to understand something more clear than just try catching it. So used runtime validations is pretty cool. Um, the other tool is also great. It's called JSON Schema. And maybe it is more clear for guys who were working with XSDs, XML schema definitions back in the days. Um, it is actually the same, but for JSON. So you can uh, make use of that. It is a specification, so you can implement it in Java, let's say, or in uh, C Sharp. That's uh, some flexibility of this tool. Take a look. Um, and the last tip, uh, which should uh, maybe the first tip, tip number zero, it is called evolutionary approach. Um, so the idea is that if you have some changes, maybe you don't need to do these changes, but rather mark your old, uh, your old um, data shape as deprecated instead. 
So when changing something, we actually have not, very, not too much cases. Uh, the first one is renaming. So let's see here, we have some symbol and we want to rename it to the code for some reasons. So let's not do that. It's not, uh, it's not uh, matching this evolutionary, evolutionary approach. What you do instead, you create this new code property, but you leave the old symbol property, so it worked with the previous versions, and you mark it as deprecated. Um, maybe you can put some graceful period, let's say three months, and after three months you can remove this symbol property if you want, uh, if there are no, uh, no users left that are using this property. So property renaming. The second case is when you remove the property. Uh, if you want to remove the property, just don't. <laughs> Very easy to remember. Market is deprecated and also remove it after some graceful period. Um, so this tip is how to not write migration scripts. Just uh, mark them as deprecated. Uh, a bit more complex example is when hierarchy changes. So let's say you want to put the symbol inside some instrument over here. Um, once again, the solution is the same. Just uh, leave the old symbol and uh, create a new hierarchy near, right? So it works with the previous versions. Okay, so that's all that I have today. Let's summarize what we've learned. Um, first of all, user data is very important. Always think about it and users, your users will be happy and uh, your business will thrive because of this. Um, to save user data, use some data migration, migration tools that I explained today. And there are, of course, several options to do it. Many companies uh, are creating their custom migrators. Um, I told you about a specific case called front-end data migration. And I think the best fit here is when, uh, best fit to use it is when you're developing a product or a library that you're going to uh, bring as a service to another team. And you, you need to have this concentrated knowledge about the data that you want to migrate in your team in this case, use front-end data migration. It works good for us. I think it can work for you as well. Um, and yeah, about the tips, test a lot, make loggings and reportings, it's your eyes. Uh, make use of some runtime validations of uh, TypeScript types and use evolutionary approach so you don't need to make this a migration script at all. All right, so that's all I have, guys. Thank you all. Wish you all seamless migrations. Thank you, Alex, for such a comprehensive presentation. We have a couple of questions in the chat. So the first question from my one, is there any software for front-end data migration? Yeah, as I already mentioned, uh, there are a couple of software, uh, Liquibase, FlyDB, uh, Flyway, sorry, um, the Postgres database and MongoDB. As I know, they have their own migration um, techniques, so to say. So people are using them. But most companies, as I know, they're writing their own solutions because they have uh, a lot of specifics and these specifics cannot be... Um, you don't know what uh, you have to work with before you do it. <laughs> so yeah, not much software but there are some solutions. Okay, great. Let's jump to the next one. Sergey is asking, have you ever tried that front-end on the fly migrations approach under old school relational databases on the backend? How well does the solution work in this mode? What do you think? Uh, yeah, so the solution I explained to you today is actually working in Postgres. So we are saving it uh, in the form of plain data. Let me quickly jump to the slide. Yes, so this plain data, you need to ask your backend developers uh, to just store it as text without any indexing. Uh, of course, this approach would not work for some um, very heavy data, but uh, it would work for some small data that other people do not care about. Of course, uh, if you have a schema in a database, then you need to ask your backend developers to update the schema as well. And then the solution is just worthless. Got it. Thanks. 
uh, and another one uh, from the cat. So uh, it is about both topics of our uh, meetup. So how the data transformation like yours described can affect performance? Um, I don't think too much because you have a lot of transformations anyway in JavaScript. Uh, and nowadays we have a lot of these functional approaches. So a lot of data is uh, floating here and there. So it's just uh, some function call. Uh, for our layout, let's say in chart, it can be about one megabyte. Uh, and it's not very hard to transform this one megabit to something else. And anyway, you would uh, save, uh, persist this uh, data to the backend. And then when you receive it uh, next time, it, you would not need to migrate. So you do it only once and then you're okay. So performance is not affected here too much. Yes, thank you, Alex, for the answer. And uh, I have also one more from my side. Um, you mentioned that uh, using the sons of live migration approach, it it can be risky if the data is very important for user, right? Because you you make it on the fly. And is it possible to just uh, use this approach for some not important user data and for some critical one use some more, more classical approach? Yeah, definitely. Thanks for the question. You can mix up the solutions. Uh, the one that I described here, the front end, is uh, very good if you're developing a library. So the only benefit here I see is uh, if you lack some backend developers and uh, you want to concentrate knowledge in your team. Um, so other teams do not bother about your data. If you have this, uh, a lot of specialists and uh, you can delegate the data migration to correct people which are working with data, then you should do it, of course. But uh, here we are talking about front end and uh, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of these uh, backendless solutions are, are more trending nowadays. So we can do it without backend guys. Who need backends? <laughs> <laughs> Who need backends in 2022, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is front-end meetup, so we can we can tell it out loud. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. Thank you, Alex and George. Thank you very much for your presentations, for your speech. And uh, thanks, everyone, for watching us. Please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And uh, we posted a link to the meetup.com group again. So please join, uh, join it, and you will have all detailed information about our next offline meetup. So we really want to see you finally in real life, not on the uh, YouTube translations only. Um, thanks, everyone.